Well, first of all, thank you, um, President Spurgle. Never thought the day would come. Speaking about connections, I think David can speak more clearly about that. When you speak, if you can't speak your truth, your experiences, then it's somebody else's truth. Um, I met David 20 years ago. I want you to think about that, okay? <laughs> I met David 20 years ago. Um, I was at Stanford struggling to make it as a postdoc. It was my second postdoc. Everybody was a superstar, okay, except me. <laughs> That's at least how I felt. And, you know, probably the most, at, at that time, the most important cosmologist came to visit, visit us, considered by many of us the most important cosmologist, um, one of the most, of them, I would think the most important, came to visit us at Stanford with some fancy guy named Professor Spurgle, David Spurgle. So I'm looking for this for Spurgle guy in a sea of other Nobel laureates and fancy people in tuxedos and things like this. That time I had long dreadlocks and I wore my dreadlocks and I, have a, I had African medallion. I used to wear that. I was into X-Clan and you know, whatever, into weird kind of music. So clearly I stood out in this place where I was the only African-American in the entire cohort at Stanford University. Um, I don't know, over, I mean, hundreds of people there. There's a reception going on, and I go to some guy that looks like a jazz musician. Again, I'm stereotyping this guy because he had a long goatee, wore a Hawaiian shirt, sandals, <laughs> right? Super long beard. I was like, okay, I could definitely talk to this guy. <laughs> hey, what are you doing here? No, I'm just hanging out with him. So, hey, where's this Spurgle guy? You, you see him around? I'm David Spurgle. <laughs> so that's what connections look like. Because because you think what what happened right after that, we didn't talk about jazz, we were talking we were talking science. So we started talking. Now, I want to now, so that just is a confirmation that it's no mistake that 20 years later, after many years of scientific collaborations and being at the blackboard and all this stuff, right? Two years ago, when the pandemic really hit hard, about a week after George Floyd's uh, murder, David Spurgle got on the phone with me and Brian Keaton. And the com conversation was, see, because we're, du we're duds, we only know what works for us. And you know, regardless, we're, we're three different types of individuals, okay? Brian is very different than me and very different than David, David's different than me. But we come together on one thing, we connect on one thing, which is that we love to play with signs. And it doesn't matter what it is, you see? It's sort of in that Richard Feynman tradition, or my mentor, Leon Cooper, they're just interested in solving scientific problems. Well, it just so happens our playground at the time was cosmology, particle physics, fundamental physics. But the point is, our relationship, our connection is catalyzed by that act, that act of pro that, that's productive, number one, right? But number two, it's in the act, it's in those act where you're challenged with a problem, right? And you are arguing sometimes, disagreeing that the relationships are built. So that is a byproduct in the sense of the task at hand. And that's part of the scientific enterprise, what you, you are now becoming a part of. So that's, I'm by the way, improvising this because that's what I do okay. But now let me tell you, I'm gonna use the rest of my time to kind of tell them the story, okay? So, um, so I'm, I just wanna give an example. I just gave an example of how this connection thing works. Is that you never, I never thought that 20 years later that the guy in Hawaiian shirt would be the president of the Science Foundation, breakthrough award winner, and that Brian would be the director of Simon's Observatory, and I would be hanging around their coattails and like, you know, Drinking free wine. I'm just saying, <laughs> um, <laughs> writing papers. We still write papers. We're writing a paper right now as we speak. That's an amazing president of the foundation, right? Someone that's still doing their science. We'll see how long it sticks on. <laughs> <laughs> I've managed for a month. <laughs> I, I, I was like, how did you get a chance to read all of this paper? Because like, you know, your, your detailed response was like, right? I was like, well, this guy's like, I did like 15 David Spurgles going on. <laughs> All right, so here's the story I'm going to show you. So I went to a pretty a small but very intense and competitive undergraduate institution. Okay, 
And yes, I'm proud to say I turned Harvard down on the full ride to go to this small abroad Quaker school because I wanted intense it up on undergraduate experience. Well, I got my tail whipped left and right. By junior year, I really didn't, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this, this physics degree thing. You know, I'm gonna graduate with my physics degree and I'm just gonna become an engineer or something like that. I didn't really have any prospects of doing physics in the future. Then I had this weird experience, not a weird experience. There was an opportunity for me to get a job. Well, I can go work at McDonald's in the summertime. I want you to remember this is like 1988, okay? So, we don't have the computers and the, the you know, internet and things. I was using a VAX machine. Somebody knew what a VAX machine is, okay? All right. So, and we were the only department that had a VAX machine back then. All right. So, a job prospect was go back to the Bronx, get a job in New York somewhere. Or there was this all year experience to go to Carnegie Mellon in a field that had nothing to do with anything I knew. It was in the computer engineering department with a guy named Mark Kreider, who actually did a PhD in applied physics at Cornell and invented the optical drive. So it was computer engineering stuff. It had nothing to do with my background in physics. I was a junior. During that summer, I go into the lab and then there was a postdoc, this guy named Francis, a Korean guy, who had a cross actually, he also had a cross. I guess he was named after St. Francis. But anyway, Francis um, took me to the lab and said, this is, you know, what, what you're going to be doing. Here are the lasers, and um, here's a manual. Just go ahead, and he disappeared. And then my advisor, Mark Crichton, was going mountaineer. He was a serious mountaineer guy. And he disappeared into the mountains. So here I'm in this lab. And then days would go on. I'm like, what's going on? Where's my boss at? <laughs> Where's his boss? I mean, nobody's around. He said, well, I contacted Francis. Listen, Francis came in. Make a long story, at some point, it occurred to me, at age 19, at some point it occurred to me, wait a minute, I'm getting paid to do this? Because, what I, what, let me just go further here. In the lab, I was learning a little bit of how to build the circuitry, how to operate the laser, all this stuff. I'm learning all these, and I'm picking up all these things. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not doing research, but I'm, like, I'm learning these techniques. And I go to my boss, he was checking at me three weeks, coming from a mountaineer trip. And he's like, yeah, how's it going, Stefan? <laughs> I'm like, well, uh, uh, okay. I tripped up on this, I did this, whatever. I'll uh, make a long story short. He was like, that's exactly what you should be doing here. So I was like, wait, I'm getting paid to show up, leave kind of when I want, right? This is, and then, and then, wait, my future self, my boss, is going mountaineering in the summertime. Like, he's, and Francis, the postdoc, is like, making me do all the work, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, my point was that that's when I caught the bug. That's when I realized a career in science. And also, the important thing here, it didn't matter what kind of science it was. There's something about the scientific enterprise that you belong to in the game of research. Connection now looks like a physics student commute, talk, working with a computer engineer and studying domain walls of all things, right? What was my PhD dissertation? Topological defects in cosmology. One of those objects are called domain wall. So I want you to, I want, I want to share that story because when you look at your future self, which I hope is somebody that, you know, some of you in your future may go into what have you, but one of the things I really do hope is that you've caught some of the bug. Um, you will keep your connections going with each other and with your mentors and with this cohort, right? I want to use this time also, and let me just say that when I went to graduate school, it had its challenges. When I went to both sides have its challenges, but all along the way, my love and my drive to play with science, I, I always found the, the right people to engage me at that. And I want you to focus on that. Focus on that which is productive. And realize, as um, my great mentor, Jim Gates, once said, he gave a talk at MIT not too long ago amongst all of the alumni at MIT, 
who went to MIT undergraduate PhD. Jim was asked, he was given a talk about his adinkras, this crazy math stuff he's doing. And this was supposed to be um, something about social justice that he was supposed to be talking to MIT. And then somebody, one of the alums, raised his hands uh, you know, on a wave and, and says, where is it, what, what do you have to say about social justice? And he goes, this is my social justice. This research that I discovered I'm to do fundamental physics and the fact that I am here as a product of MIT, as a PhD and a former professor, this is my social justice. The act of doing this, right? So if I didn't stay in the game, I wouldn't have not. And if I didn't connect with people like David and Brian Keaton, to name a few, Leon Cooper, in the quest of science and in the enterprise of research, those relationships are so strong. They're based on this thrive, this human enterprise, which makes it our enterprise, right? And those relationships will come about very naturally. You're part of something big, you're part of something bigger than even this room. And I want to use this opportunity to, 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 um, to say how proud I, am, proud I am of what you've accomplished. And I want to thank Casey. I want to thank the staff. At the foundation, I want to thank Saran and her staff. Um, very thrilled that you know. She's, and of course, I want to thank our president, uh, David Spurgle, for his vision and your continued um, commitment and support to this effort for as long as I've known you. 